Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to let, I encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website, powells.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Top Chef star and fellow Portlander Gregory Gorday in conversation with Nom Nom Paleo's Michelle Tam about, Gorday, about Gorday's debut cookbook, Every, Everyone's Table, next Tuesday, the 11th. If you don't already do so, please consider following us on social media. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Larissa Pham and Mary H.K. Choi. Larissa Pham is an artist and writer in Brooklyn. She has written essays and criticism for the Paris Daily Review, The Nation, Art in America, Guernica, and elsewhere. Like a song that feels written just for you, Pham's debut work of nonfiction captures the imagination and refuses to let go. Pop Song is a book about love and about falling in love with a place or a painting or a person and the joy and terror inherent in the experience of that love. Plumbing the well of culture for clues and patterns about love and loss from Agnes Martin's abstract paintings to James Turrell's transcendent light works and Anne Carson's Eros the Bittersweet to Frank Ocean's Blonde. Pham writes of her youthful attempts to find meaning in travel, sex, drugs, and art before sensing that she might need to turn her gaze upon herself. There is hearty heartache in these pages, but Pham's electric ways of seeing create a perfectly fractured portrait of a modern intimacy that is triumphant in both its vulnerability and restlessness. Joining FAM in conversation tonight is Mary H.K. Choi. Choi is <laughs> the New York Times bestselling author, author of Emergency Contact, Permanent Record, and Yoke. She lives in New York. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question as well as if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Larissa and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from, from us. A link to buy Pop Song along with Mary's books will be shared in the chat a couple times this evening. So Larissa, Mary, it is such a joy to welcome you and thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks so much. Um, that was such a wonderful and enthusiastic introduction. Um, so I thought I would just get right into it and read a little from Pop Song. Um, this is from uh, Camera Roll, the chapter on photography. And forgive me, I'll be reading off my screen. Looking at you, I know you're here. Notes on photography. The most intimate photographs are photographs made at night in the dark. There are two ways to take a photograph at night. You can set the aperture large and the shutter speed slow. Opening the aperture gives the photograph a small depth of field. The range of what you can capture will be shallow, but it lets as much light in through the lens as possible. When the light hits the lens, it reflects through a series of mirrors onto the film, which is sensitive. The slower the shutter speed, the longer the light can pass through. This way, the film has more time to react to its presence, building up value. This is called lengthening the exposure. If you do it right, and you don't always know how it will come out, when you develop and print your film, you will have an image deep and luminous with true blacks and gentle highlights. The shine on a white eye, the glowing fabric of a white t-shirt, a lover's shy smile in the dark. The other option is to use a flash. Here, you can keep the exposure, exposure short the aperture small. Mount it on your camera and, as a shutter is open, throw your surroundings into sudden brilliance, like lightning through a window. This process creates shadows. These are the two ways. One lets light in slowly, the other is a violation. When you weren't looking, I took a photograph of you. It was quiet and you were sleeping. That was the first of my many thefts. It was just the light was so beautiful, and so were you in it. Lo, everything, the bed, our scattered clothes, the level of light in the room. I stood in the doorway, carefully balancing my weight on the floorboards so as to not wake you. Looking at the curve of your spine, the hard, pure shape of your shoulders, the way the street lamp cast a perfect parallelogram on the wall. It was early days, and we were still tenuous and new. I slid my finger on the screen to adjust the white balance, trying to capture the dimness of the light, 
trying to render you in a way as perfect and real as the way I was seeing you. How little it takes now, digital. There was the image forever if I wanted it, which I might, I'm referring to it now. I have never shown it to you. I used to do this before when I was younger, take photographs of lovers. I thought it was remarkable then. I didn't realize there was a precedent that I was following in the way of everyone who has become close to another. At night, in different bedrooms, I'd set the shutter speed to extremely slow, holding my breath to get, to get the exposure. Mornings were different, early, always early, and the light flat, gray, no gold in it whatsoever. Short exposures then, and the aperture small, capturing every detail of the room. Days later, the roll done and packed with mystery. I'd rinse photo paper and chemicals and watch as faces rose out of nothing into the red light of the dark room. When you print a photograph, you're using the information you've captured on the film. The parts where the silver is built up don't let the light in. The page stays white, but the areas of shadow, those are clear. You can see right through. So how little have you of you had I captured? And how little did I have left? My night exposures, the film for those was nearly transparent. Tiny smears of silver marking a smile, a highlight on skin, white teeth. How little there was that had exposed and how tenuous. I could only see the details with a magnifying glass. Sometimes I think about how in the photographic process you are taking old light and reflecting it from surface to surface, trying to preserve the information that it's stored. That's all we're doing in photography, moving light from place to place. In the fifth century BCE, the philosopher Moti closes the door to his study. Through a crack in the wood, the light passes through, creating an image on the opposite wall. He's enchanted by this remarkable coincidence. He studies it and records the image. He calls what he has discovered a locked treasure room. A hundred years later, Aristotle is making a camera obscure, though he does not yet know the entirety of what he's making. He is watching the sun through a mesh of leaves, observing how the shape the light makes is circular on the ground. In 1544, Gemma Frisius is sitting in his darkened room observing an eclipse through a tiny pinhole, the wire thin outline of the sun visible on the wall. Ovilar, France, 2012. I am 19. I'm studying at a month long painting and drawing workshop in the south of France in a tiny village too far west from its time zone so that the nights blend into evening and the sky remains a luminous blue as late as 11 p.m. When I come back from making lunch on one of the last days, our studio is darkened, the windows covered in cardboard. And when my eyes adjust, I can see the pale green shape of trees susurrating across the far wall. There is the parking lot, the edge of the garden, shimmering faintly as if in a dream. Two of my fellow students are outside, running in circles in the parking lot to give us something to see inside our camera obscura. I see their legs, their swift, dappled shapes. And I feel so young younger even, like I've never been born. I feel like I've seen this before, children laughing and playing, half remembered, like something I once saw on television. August 21st, 2017, New York City. You are watching the solar eclipse through a pinhole you've made with a cereal box in tin foil. You hold it in front of your eyes, like a pair of ski goggles. When you move your head, the tiny crescent of the sun moves too, ping-ponging off the walls of the singular observ observatory you've made. This delights you and you do it again and again. Why did I take those photographs? Why have I done it again? It was always about being somewhere no one else was and taking something that no one would know had ever been. In critique, I said it was about combating the male gaze, about claiming desire back from them, but that was a lie. My eye wasn't possessive of people. It was only the closeness between us I craved. I knew I was going to lose it one day and I wanted to make it visible as though I could turn the way you touched me into a substance to hold. I wasn't hard. I wanted to soften you, bringing your image up in a long, slow exposure to conjure how you looked at me in the dark. 
But that was always why I made to keep time where it is and hold it long enough to carry with me into the next interval of feeling. I knew that I was running against time, against its passage, against the inevitability of change, against the chance that you and I would grow distant and apart from each other. And it's true that all photographs capture is dead time, the instant between your breaths. Though if you believe that time is all around us all at once, then I'm still here in bed next to you, waiting for the shutter to click. And here I am in the dark room, watching your image rise up out of the fog. And here I am telling you the story of how we came to be. Thank you. Oh, what a treat. That's so, it's so special to have you read that. Um, especially because it's like so recent in my mind. Um, I just want to take a moment, like how, I mean, this book is exquisite and it's so tender and it's so juicy. It's like so delicious. And I really want to acknowledge it for like the sizable offering that it is like in terms of like the excavation that took place <laughs> for it to exist. Um, how, how did you like celebrate it like being in the world? I mean, that's a, that's a great question because I think I'm still a little bit in shock. Like I know, I know that it's in the world. I know that it like everyone can read it and I hope people do. But at the same time, I feel like maybe what you're actually asking is like, how did I celebrate like maybe when I finished writing it, which I think is like kind of like the first phase of like when you know something is done, right? When you're like, oh, like this is done. I don't have to like deal with it anymore. Like it's it's out of my hands now. I've created it. Um, and that was like a really exciting time for me. It was like last summer. <laughs> And I like turned in my last edits and we were like looking at the proofs and I was like, oh, like this is this, this is like its own thing now. It can go out into the world without me. That was very exciting. But you don't, don't do you ever, did you have like that like greed or like ambition around it? Like, you know, the way that um, parents are like, I'm responsible for this, I'm responsible for that, but also like mm -hmm. this person's happiness. <laughs> like, you know, when you're writing especially like autobiographic, like nonfiction, it's like you're living alongside it, you're evolving, you're like still drawing breath. And this mm -hmm. thing is just like finished. Like, was it hard to decide, like, like say a little bit earlier than the proofs, like, was it hard to decide that this thing was, that was it, that was the thing now? Like you yeah. put the little belly button yeah. and it's done. <laughs> I mean, I, I finished writing this during the pandemic, um, which I think is an experience you're familiar with too. Um, so it was like such a condensed like amount of time writing. And there did just hit a point where I was just like, oh, like I've said everything that I needed to say um, for this book. And it felt good to just acknowledge like I had sort of hit my limit of like what this project was. Like I knew that it was everything that it needed to be. And like, if I had another idea, I could have another idea at another time. No, totally. So you finished writing during the pandemic or were you like, did, were you like editing during the pandemic? Like, I was did you finish during, both? Yeah, finishing like writing and editing, like basically like in, in that first like six months. Wow. Was yeah. there, I mean, when you're writing something this like intimate and this like intense and then the world gets really intense, and like, obviously you are a person who feels things very, very deeply as a, like a sensitive human being. Like, how did you, how did you know where you were? And like, what were some of the sort of caretaking things that you built, built for yourself? Like both with your support network and like, just, just to, to be tethered a little bit to people who at least like knew where you were, like to drop a spiritual mm -hmm. pin, you know, because yeah. like, obviously this is like such difficult work to do during specific times like that. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty wild because I, I don't think I was really prepared to do this. Like um, I've never written something so like deeply personal before. Um, and I think like 
it, it really took like getting into the text in order to realize like the amount of excavation that was happening. Um, and in a way, I'm really grateful that like everyone around me was home for it. <laughs> True. <laughs> so like you know like I, I live with roommates and like everyone around me was like oh yeah like this is this thing you're doing and like we're all like acknowledging that like you're gonna be like a monster in the living room like hunched over your laptop <laughs> like just like being a gremlin and like we're gonna encourage you to be a gremlin and we know that this is what you're going through um and so I was like every day just like kind of like scraping at like the back wall of my soul like looking for like what I needed to say um but like all the morsels yeah really like just like kind of like <laughs> crying like just like trying to like be the most true um mm. but I feel like like being the most honest I could possibly be um but yeah like it I don't know I almost had to like regress in a way I don't know if I could have do done this like in an ordinary timeline to totally because then because yeah. then you're like <laughs> hanging back and forth between like where you are and then like having to put on this like different face for like outside purposes or like selling yourself in a different way or for like, I don't know, like networking things or like yeah. events, you know? Um, actually on that note, like you wrote that in the mid, in your book, you write that in the mid 2010s, the dominant mode by which a young hungry writer could enter the conversation was by deciding which of her traumas she wished to monetize. And like, I do this and I, I wonder if you've been, if you did this too, where like, you're like, okay, you can have this pound of flesh, but there are like things that I've saved for myself. Not only just, and like, not even like for life, because for me personally, like as a SAS too, like everything is coffee, but like, I'm like, it's like a producer being like, you can't have this beat. This is for me. And mm -hmm. so I wonder if, was there a part of you that either like saved or held back any personal essays over the years where you were like, I'm going to do something with this for myself. And did that sort of intention like create this willingness to like completely disembowel yourself for this because it was for you? Totally. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, I think I think we all went through that period of like, oh, gotta, gotta flog myself um, for the world. And I think that's fine. Like, I think that that was like super empowering for a lot of people and it was for me and, um, as much as I like sort of take umbrage with it. But I think like, I think reading other other memoirs, like reading like Lesley Jamison, for example, who's like a huge influence on this text, um, reading other people kind of like going balls to the wall um, in their books made me realize like I could, I too could, could do that um, in the safety of, of like a more, like a serious book. Um, and so I think when I became conscious that that was like a thing that you could do, you could, you could save things for yourself. Um, I did, I did begin to like, kind of hold on to it, knowing that like, whether or not I like, there's still things that I have withheld from this book itself as well. Um, that like might come out in a novel or might, or might never come out. Um, but yeah, I think once I like realized that there could be a container that could be worthy and like um that I could really pour myself into that wasn't the internet um then it became to feel like a possibility yeah and it so hits different when it's not the fucking internet it, it just really hits does. different it absolutely does it, it I think like you enter a contract when you open a book with like you enter into a contract with the author like you're like I'm ready like I spent like 26 dollars on this like I'm gonna read it like with my eyes and turn the pages and I think that's yeah. really valuable yeah it's very like let's fucking go um mm -hmm. actually on that like your dedication is if you've ever sung along to a song on the radio this is for you who are you actually imagining I guess like I mean well I think of like like those like TikToks of like dogs with like their heads out the window. Um, <laughs> like that's kind of like my immediate response. Um, but I am, I am thinking of like this feeling that I'm always trying to capture, which is like when you like get so caught up in like almost like a sort of like over identification with something like really corny um, where you're like, that's me. Like you listen to a song and you're like, that's me. Like I'm gonna sing along to this. Like I, I feel this so deeply. Um, so I was thinking about who that that kind of person might be and like I like I like people who listen to the radio <laughs> it's like Same. the thing that you do like 
you know, you're driving around and it's, it's not Spotify. Like it's, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's so like joyful. And it's like one of those moments where like, it's like one of those like sublime moments that like for a second, you're just sort of like offered a reprieve from like sitting in your own audience. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, so not self-conscious. It's so like, it's so like before social media, it's like this like very pure other place. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's also like a communal experience, I think. Like oh, listening totally. listening to the radio. Um, I don't know, it's like it's like seeing a billboard or like seeing like a really good sunset. Like it, it is it is shared in some way. And I, I also I love when everyone is like watching the same sunset together. Like that is that is very beautiful to me. Yeah, I mean, you're clearly a truly, like, you're such a pure heart. Like, you're, like, the emo -ist. To even call you sincere just feels like, I don't know, like, too lightweight. Um. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. Like, I have a question, actually, and it's almost like, it's like reader etiquette in a way. Like, you know, this book is about love, obviously, and it's also about pain in the, in, in, in the way that, like, everything is always tinged with pain because by dint of like everything is fleeting because, you know, because mortality, but you know, this, you talk about like gender trauma and like racialized trauma and your personal trauma. And I kind of have this thing too, like you give it, you've delivered so much in this book. And do you have this thing where like, you want everyone to read it. You would definitely want everyone to buy it, buy it in hardcover, buy it for your friends, buy it for freaking everyone, buy it because you're Asian, buy it because you're, you know, like <laughs> a human, like buy, just buy the fucking book, support the book. But for me, like, you know, I've written about like family sickness, like mm -hmm. um, eating disorders, like sexual trauma, all this stuff, like um, non-consensual, like sex, rape, all of it. But there are like, there's only certain people that I want to talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. like if you're like if you're like a woman and you're Asian or you're a minority and you're like I have this I did I'm like yes come inside let's talk but I pretty much don't want anyone else to refer to anything that they've read about me that they paid money for like how do you feel about that with this book it's similarly frankly <laughs> I mean <laughs> it's, it's 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 like it's definitely like the kind of project where it's like well I'm just gonna trust you to have the encounter with the text that is like honest to you knowing and I'm like it's like I me am trusting you reader to um accept this text with like the generosity which with which that I've like tried to share it and um yeah I mean it is terrifying to think about like people who I, I have not imagined reading this um speaking to me about it or sending me an email about it like that does sound kind of scary but at the same time like I I also wanted I don't know maybe you also relate to this feeling of like I really wanted to articulate some experiences that like I felt really alone in um like narratives that I had not seen um in my own life when I was kind of going through these things and I was like well if I can tell someone how it felt and if it can ring true to like another Asian woman like in college like trying to figure some stuff out then I feel like I've I've done my job and I'll always take that for some reason I'll always take that like I'm like well you know what like I'll put up with anything else if I can just give someone that <laughs> no true like there is like a really deep service element to the work that we do and like you know, it is expensive and there are moments where it's a little bit like, why are we like this? But we're like, why do we have to do this? But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I take that, I take that really seriously. Um, it is interesting though. And I, I don't say this as to be like, beware, but like, because the writing itself is, and like the art criticism is so like muscular and like, just like, ah, uh, satisfying. And, you know, the prose is just like, it's just chef's kiss. Like this book is so <laughs> beautiful and like so considered. And like, I just I just can imagine those people that like approach you wanting to talk about like turns of phrases or like language or like references or like correct you on references without sort of like catching themselves, acknowledging that the story is about like 
violation or pain or bruising or broken heart, you know, that these things actually happen to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, like, there's a, there's a, there's a question that I just wanted to ask from Sarah, like how is the process of capturing the intersection of artistic mediums in writing, like writing about photography, for instance, is so different than looking at a photograph. Like what new insights, if any, did you, do you feel like you gained into other art forms by putting all of this stuff into words? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's, that's sort of connected to like these points of language, right? Um, but, um, I'm going to parse this thought a little bit to make sure that I'm saying it the right way that I want to. Um, I feel like I listen to, hold on, I'm just going to, um, sorry, my roommates are being a little. Are they texting you? Are they iMessaging you? Are they blowing your shit up? No, oh, they just walked <laughs> in and I just want to be like, oh, I'm going to call. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so real life interrupts. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I think writing about art is like I think criticism is its, its own sort of form um, that I think like illuminates the work in a way um, that like like I personally always like love art so much more when someone tells me about it, um, whether that's like the artist or like if it's like someone working at a museum who has a relationship to the work, um, like. I, I feel like I can understand something better if I have a little context for it. And sometimes like that can also just be like description. It doesn't even have to be like someone explaining it to me, just like someone telling me like, well, this is how this was put together. This is what it consists of. Um, and so like when we talk about like writing about photography, for example, like they're different mediums, like looking at a photo will give you one experience. But like the experience that you have looking at a picture is maybe going to be different from my experience and perhaps I have an experience with the work that I want to share um, with the world and um, being able to share that is like my way of kind of like giving an interpretation I guess so I don't I don't know if like I have any new insights so much as like it's a form of like articulation um, like I I think like hearing what other people think about art has helped me open my mind to things that like um, maybe like a painting was not to my taste or maybe I didn't understand like why someone loved a photographer so much. Um, but hearing about it, I think just like brings more context. I uh, actually really rambly. Love, no, I actually, I think that that's right on the money. And there's a few things that I really loved about this book. And it, it's this fun thing where it's like, it's early in the book's release. So I don't want to be like spoilers, but like, I really love what you do um, in terms of like the way you contextualize things, the sort of like archiving that you do in terms of like setting it up in a larger context, both like chronologically or like in terms of like how there's a through line for you throughout like different mediums. But I also love like, again, like I feel like curation has just been like that poor word um, and the inch and what the internet has done to it. But like, mm -hmm. you know, even seeing artwork when um, you mention when you're in China and it's like in an art fair, like seeing artwork in an art fair is so different under the mm -hmm. neon lighting and this like weird, like almost like battery chickens thing where it's just like, yeah, oh God, actually, like. That's a good way yeah. of putting it. No, I, I, I so I, I do it's funny, like there are sort of like criticisms that become really didactic or just sort of show offy about like how much this person learned, like knows mm -hmm. that I, I find tiresome, but I don't have that. And I think it's because your work, it always like, even in the, in the excerpt that you read, it's just like, you know, like you're in a room and then just like, just as effortlessly you're like, and then in the fifth century BC and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely coming here too, <laughs> you know, like, let's go. Um, so, you know, this goes for Blue and Body of Work, which are just two really gorgeous, sprawling, like just kind of almost like fractal essays mm -hmm. in like, they're like unpredictable, but it's so seamless where it goes. And it really feels like the contours of just the way your mind maybe works. But, and then also you're like moving around geographically in the pieces, which is mm -hmm. interesting. And, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine how many versions there were, could be, or got edited, or got changed. And 
what is your process like for writing essays like that or even the book itself where it's Mm -hmm. like do you have a list like how do you even populate an essay like that so it takes those shapes and you do it like multiple times in this book yeah yeah um it's so funny something you said made me think of like how I've been thinking of my 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 character and because I do think of like my narrator as like a character it's not like 100% like the whole me it's just like a lot of me um but it's just like oh I'm just like a little person like looking around like I'm just like a person in the world like looking around and like this is what I see um but yeah I think with those essays uh I I I have to be honest like my editorial process is like pretty it's like non-existent it's it's very um I basically like write a bunch of paragraphs and then I move them around there's no rhyme or reason to it. So you're like a pure, you're like a beautiful mind or like minority report. And you're like, rah, 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 rah. that's like, kind of like, kind I'm of like, like so jealous. Is that like a browser window mentality or? I don't know. It's like, I know a lot of people use index cards. Um, mm. And I think I could be an index card power user. Um, if I were like, but do you, do you use index cards? I, I do not. I do not. I literally so like, what, like, how does it go? I have like two documents. I'll have two documents open, open and one will be the working draft and I will kind of just like free write very like acrobatically into it. Um, assuming that I will hinge everything that needs to be hinged. And also um, part of the structure of this book was also like trusting in the reader to be able to hinge certain things um, and trying not to like maybe overconnect as well. like like to not over explain to just be like I'm gonna jump from here to here and you can come with me or you cannot but like I'm trusting that you will I'm trusting that you'll make the leap um and editorially it meant that also my my editor had to trust me to make that leap um but I have these two docs and I'll just like write 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 in one of them and then if something doesn't fit I'll take it and I'll put it in the other one which is kind of like my scrap pile and then I'll just like move stuff around from like one doc to the other until it starts to make sense I wish I I could explain it in a better way no it it, actually and if you read this book you'll be like oh yeah like 3.14159 like that totally makes sense because there's like this like limberness and it's not like flabby it's just so like you know a lot of people have likened this book to a mixtape or a playlist and you're it's so fucking confident the way you're like we're like at no point and am I like where is this going you're like you're coming with me you're coming with me you're coming with me and I'm like I'm going with you I'm going with you I'm going with you and how did you like I don't know like and this is such a projection question and I don't mean it to sound patronizing because genuinely this is for a question for me I am like being greedy about this about your process but like how do you get to be an authority that way being like this is what the shape this is what shape this book is Mm. it's a pretty singular shape and like at what point are you like you're just all gonna have to fucking trust me this is what's happening I yeah I mean I I I say that I sort of like crank it out but I I do I do delete a lot um which I think is maybe another important part is like there's a lot that doesn't make it in there's a lot of writing that is writing towards something and then that writing is like well I got to the point that I needed to and I figured out the feelings emotionally that I needed to go through and Mm -hmm. now I will put that away so no one sees it um so what what is left is like yeah this like confident like acrobatic thing um but I think in terms of form like it was really important to me like going into this project that I was able to write like something this weirdly shaped and experimental um like I, I definitely like not to get too nuts and boltsy with these things, but like when we were trying to sell it um, and like find it a home for it, like an editor for it, like I was very much like, yeah, like I want to be able to write this way. Um, and I want whoever I work with to trust me um, and trust that I can take us where we need to go. That also meant that I was writing a book that I didn't really know where I was gonna end up. Um, like 80% of the time so it yeah was, I mean it was, a, it was an exercise <laughs> yeah I mean you stick the motherfucking landing like for real um thank you so like yeah no I think that that is just like a really huge thing and actually 
a, a really joyful sort of careen, like careening aspect of the book that I really loved as a person who is actually colorblind was the way you talk about color and like how immersive that can be. And like, you know, it's almost much like a song. It's like, oh yeah, that reminds me of this time in my life. And I'm wondering like even the note taking for something like that, like how do you even remember? Like, it's like, I can taste it. It's like so vivid. And it seems so clear to me that that memory is just like, just, you just have this like photographic feeling for what it was like. And it's sort of like, and color is a huge part of that. Like, how do you even take a note for something like that? Do you take a picture at that point? Or are you like, you know, like writing down like the name of a color? Like, how does that, like how, what is the recall process like for that? Yeah, I mean, I feel really like kind of spoiled in, in, in the fact that like paint color names are so evocative. Mm. Um, so like, it's like this whole vocabulary that I feel really lucky to have access to, but um, I take a lot of photos. Um, like I, my memory is like, honestly, like not amazing. And I take a lot of pictures. And um, so like, I have like basically like really sharp moments in my life that are like, I totally know everything that was going on. I can remember like the smell, the texture, the color, the light, it's always about the light. Um, and then it's just like holes, like, I, I will I will like lose like whole weeks or months um because I have depression um yeah same I'm so, very disembodied so I'm like yeah footage missing. footage missing yeah yeah but if you have like it's like if you if you have like one like sparkling memory that you can't get out of your head and I feel like this book is kind of like a collection of those like sparkling moments or like those like really um like like things that like really impressed upon you because like you're like oh well this is the moment that I learned that like you know I I have a habit of like not expressing my needs well or something like that and that becomes like that just becomes one like example a, yeah you know just like <laughs> keeping it light um yeah. <laughs> but when you have that scene like imprinted in your head like actually what when I think about it visually I I do think about like well what would it look like if I made a painting of it and like, not like a painting of it in like real life necessarily, but like a painting of it in my memory. Like, what are the colors that are coming through for me? And like, what is the atmosphere of the thing? Um, because I sort of have this like thing about like, I love photos and obviously I love photography and I rely on photography a lot, but I also am very skeptical of it. I feel like sometimes paintings capture the world better than photography. And it's kind of like that, that strange like almost like cinematic or like like manipulated quality that I think makes its way into the prose where it's like well it's not going to be like a one-to-one -one rendering of it but it is going to be like how it felt <laughs> totally yeah um this is kind of like heavy but it's something I did want to ask where it's like I know that you've written about like institutional racism and specifically your time at Yale like I remember and you and I talked about it. I've interviewed you about it before but like you know it, you you likened it to like a low grade almost radiation mm -hmm. that kills slowly that isn't overtly violent and like obviously things have become overtly violent in our time yeah. and like very recently and I was wondering like does the burden that centers Asianness in work feel different now that it is like, and you, when you're talking about like pain, when you're talking about like, like violence and like, you know, bruises and just like all of this or like total annihilation and like, you know, mm -hmm. all of these things, it's like, does it feel different in this particular moment in time than you could have really anticipated? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting knowing that like you and I are having this conversation and it's going to speak for us kind of like more than maybe it would have like three months ago. Um, like now we're sort of like symbolically representative of like a group of people that like historically has not been heard from a lot 
And I think like, as like cultural producers, like we kind of are in the spotlight in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting because the pain and the experiences of like racism or or gendered or sort of like, um, you know, miscellaneous violence that I talk about in this book, um, it's all deeply personal. But at the same time, like, it is not like, pers- like it's personal to me specifically, but I also know there are so many people who will relate to it um, mm-hmm. on, the, on the basis of identity um, and like shared experience. Uh, so it's like kind of interesting to be in this place of like, well, I did write this book wanting to speak to people who would have a similar experience as me or to articulate something for people who who could maybe use that because that's what I needed when I was going through it um so there is that but then it's like now there's this whole backdrop of like a like a larger kind of violence that um I am and am not familiar with um I don't know if that really answers your your question, but yeah, it's, I mean it does, and it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's also like the part of it that is so that like creates so much grief is that like you know, and and I don't know if you relate, but like you obviously worked in like trauma response and trauma mm-hmm. work for a really long time and had to remove yourself from it because it was yeah. like so corrosive and so so much so all the time and so sustained and you know it's kind of this thing where it's like you know Asians in America are only really ever legible in these like service positions or these support roles and like Mm. it it, for as an artist sometimes I'm kind of like you know what fuck you like like I know you want to ask me about this during APAM (laughs) like I know you want to make it a whole thing and like I don't know like I think that that is actually just one part of doing the kind of work that we do that is wonderful because there's so many myths so there's so many more more of us right mm-hmm. now yeah which is really like important um so you wrote I, I just wanted to read that like You wrote that I'd been drawn to other Asian women like me who had come to third wave white feminist sex positivity, expecting the same sort of liberation and been startled by men's capacity for cruelty. And you'd also written that we've been dumped by men who would go on to date white girls with nearly indistinguishable haircuts. I I can place exactly when this is in time. We saw in the relationships (laughs) that followed our own how fully the men we chosen could love. It was that they hadn't chosen to love us. Yeah, like you know, you you mentioned that this is a character in your book and I don't want to just presuppose that like everyone in the book is just like exactly what's going on in your life. But like, do you sometimes, you know, my partner is white and I love him dearly, but like, honestly, so many of my exes are also white. Do you sometimes like look at your dating history and your love history and, and are just like, am I like mentally unwell? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is it and like have you learned anything in doing like so much workshopping with this book that's that's such a funny um that's such a real question (laughs) um that is so real uh it's it's so funny with that passage because like on the one hand like I mean it 100% like because like we all know that experience like we all know it we've all been through it we've all dated a Matt who went on to date, <laughs> or a like, Josh <laughs> yeah like a Matt or a Josh who went on to date like an Emma and you're like uh like okay like you know like it's it's like it's not like it doesn't happen like of course it happens and like it's almost like a mockery like you, but then at the same time I'm like well like we all have depth and like there is like there is more more to like love and like human experience than like sort of this like caricature of of what it is and I feel like it's been interesting to like kind of straddle that line I think um like in my own life and thinking about like my own dating experiences um and then and then like thinking about sort of like these patterns that that do show up in like 
are kind of worth skewering. Totally. I mean, if not, if we aren't going to lampoon it, then who? And also like, are we just all mentally unwell? And if so, can we at least talk about it and just to assuage some of the like shame because they're like, why even? Like why be mentally unwell and feel shameful about it? <laughs> like, it, it, it is funny. <laughs> I remember talking to my therapist about this like many years ago and she was like, well, I mean, the common denominator in all of your relationships is you. How and rude. Like, That's so... <laughs> But it, I mean, like, they weren't wrong. Like, yeah, totally. I was the common denominator. Um, and I mean, I think part of, part of like, the sort of pop song journey is like a little bit of it is about like, being willing to like, let let one's guard down, um, to sort of let the real person like be seen, so that it's like, well, I don't have to be the manic manic pixie dream girl and like if I can stop being that then maybe you won't see me that way and then like maybe we can just be two people like holding hands in a bar somewhere it's kind of like the goal oh god (laughs) your book made me so I mean it's like such a horny book it's such a sexy book but also I'm just like I miss bars I (laughs) I know there's a lot of like (laughs) there's a lot of like just going around places in it Um, oh my god which Um, I do miss (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I miss the smells and again because your writing is so like layered and immersive I'm just like huffing your book like oh my god take me there um so I want to get to some of these questions but um was it tough being so vulnerable and to show your love to the person that this book mentions yeah I mean yeah it was hard um but I guess like The, the book is, I mean, the book is many things, but I think it's also like, it is like a testament to, um, and an attempt to honor, honor like that journey. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's I, a difficult question to answer. <laughs> totally. I do. Do you ever have that thing where you're like, okay, I'm writing this book. It is, you know, it's personal essays, but they are characters. And like, again, like that, that whole thing of like anytime a non-white person writes anything about anything, it just has to be them. But like, um, I was, <laughs> did you ever have this moment where you're like, I have to like do some shit because I need to end this book. So like, should I set fire to this barn? <laughs> like what, <laughs> how, like, how do I find an ending to this book? Yeah, I mean, I definitely had, I, I knew that I wanted to, like, the time had to be really strict, like, the time period. Um, so it ends in, like, actually, like, 2018. Um, like, I finished in 2020, but there's, like, a lot of time after where I was, like, well, like, that's unprocessed. Like, we're, 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 we're going to keep that separate. Um, that's, that's, like, my life. And then this is sort of, like, well, this is a span of time that I, like, want to write about. Um, and I think having that separation in my head made it easier to sort of like look at myself from a distance and and think about like who I was then. Um, and I know there's actually another question that I think is like really interesting, which is like, how does the Larissa who started writing this book differ from the Larissa who's now finished it and seen it into the world? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's related to this. Like, I feel like there are three Larissas. There's like the one who like lived through all of this and um, and then the one who started writing it and then the one who's like sitting here now, like yapping about it. Um, and like each, each iteration, um, each iter- iteration of me is like still me, but I think it's, you know, I have, have a real tenderness towards like the me of pop song. Like I, I care about her. I wanna make sure she's okay. Um, and then the me who started writing it, I'm like, well, you had no idea what you're getting into. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like so much like tenderness and like squeeness for like all of the versions of you. Actually, there's a really beautiful quote that you wrote and it's, and it references actually your own efforts in studio art. And you talk about this idea that the sculptor might be shaped by the medium that making art was just a, as much about change on the part of the artist as it was about any kind of creation. And then you go on to say that what had finally led to any shift in me was the pure fact that I had tried anything. And I, I, I do love that sentiment. And I do think it speaks to the sort of multiplicity of like all the versions of you that it required to birth this book. 
Yeah, I mean, that's 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 from when I, I think I'm writing about like failing a lot in France. Um, I mean, I've made a lot of ba bad art in my life and I've written a lot of like, okay, or like sort of like unfinished like personal essays. I like, I had like a tiny letter for a long time <laughs> that um, was partly the genesis for this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like you have, it's like if, it's like as long as I still want to make something, I know I'm okay. It's okay if what I'm making isn't good. But like as long as I like am still willing to like pick up the pen or like sit down at my Google Doc, um, then I know that like I'm okay. Like I, there's still something like fighting <laughs> in there. No, I, and I actually really love what you were saying about how this like narration that you do the sort of coil of story like how like grounding that can be for you and like it, it almost like gives you a pursuit for every moment too which as like people with like depression and social anxiety it's nice to have a point mm -hmm. um I also there's this question why is the book called pop song such a good question um the original title was how to run away um that didn't really feel right the whole time um oh the first title was somewhere away from here the second title was how to run away neither of them really felt right and pop song kind of came to me in this like spooky dream like i don't know i just like woke up and I love was, like, oh, the title dream. the title of the book has to be pop song and i emailed my editor jonathan and i was like jonathan we're changing the title it has to be pop song and he was like it's sketchy let's do it. <laughs> um, I think I, I, I wanted it to hit like a pop song. I just wanted it to hit like a top 40. I wanted it to um, grab you and um, be something that you could return to and um, take solace in, identify with, find parts that you liked, find parts that you didn't like, like parts that you would read over and over again without even finishing the book. Like, I, I don't know, I wanted it to be that kind of like, sort of like accessible text. Um, yeah, and pop songs are catchy and I, I love pop music. I love pop music too. And actually like this, the thing about pop song and it was, it sort of came up while you were talking, which was that like, and again, like I'm so, enthralled by like the shape of this pop like of, of the book and mm -hmm. you know and and there's something about this book where you're like yep that's like that's the book and I, I feel that way about pop songs I'm like how did you not exist before you existed like of course you've always existed like this is your shape like that mm -hmm. hook has been here since like time immemorial and I just feel that way about like the shape of this book and Thank so you. like like it really hits beautifully there's like it's so like formed um so yeah I think it's really I think it's really great um Aww, thank you I mean <laughs> I I wanted I I really wanted it to just yeah I slap in, in this in the, <laughs> in the same way that you're like you know like some songs feel like you've heard it like like it always existed that way like I don't know it it was hard like to write something not knowing where I was gonna end up. Like, not in that, like, of course everything already happened. So it's not like I didn't know where I was gonna end up, but the shape of the book, I wasn't always, it wasn't always clear. Um, but I wrote the last lines of it before I finished writing the whole chapter. Um, like I kind of always knew that I wanted it to end on that note. So it's kind of a matter of like finding like the bridge to get there. It's really corny music metaphor. I'm really sorry for any musicians. No, I love it. I love I love a audience. bridge. I love a bridge. Um I actually my my last question, because we're running out of time, but like was it impossible to figure out or like to select a author photo for a book like this? Like, of course it's your first, of course it's super personal, like you know what I mean like how did the author photo come about because this that's like the face of you for this book for this like time period 
I know. And it's like me looking like super demure, like into the, <laughs> into the distance. Oh, I think it's like kind of perfect because it's, it's not like just like, you know, one of these, which is what I like every author is just like blazer. Or like, so a book, or like the, yeah, because I mean, I'm doing one of these and I was like, that's what we're doing. I don't want to talk about it. It's black and white. Go, go, go. But like, yeah. this is like I, I flipped. I was just like, I was like, I was like, shmi. Cause like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Um, I mean, the story is not that exciting, unfortunately. I think it was like maybe like week four or five of pandemic and Catapult was like, hey, so we need a high res author photo from you like yesterday. And I was like, oh no. Um, (laughs) I asked my friend, um, Adelina, who is a really talented photographer um, and she'd been wanting, she she took, she's taken pictures with me before and I some of them are like press photos for Fantasia um but I was like Adelina like please make me look beautiful um but it was really crazy because we were like in the park like fully pandemic time like nervous about scary everything York, like pan- scary like, New York. like yeah. mm-hmm. I had not washed my hair I was like just figuring out the middle part um it's new to me uh I guess not anymore it's been like a year but (laughs) well it's the pandemic look the middle part it's like yeah yeah it's very very Gen Z um but I yeah so like I was really uncomfortable (laughs) like I was not really in a place to be photographed um but Adelina made some magic happen and this was like the shot that we were like yeah this is the shot like we'll we'll go with it um it's like this kind of like pensive pensive look and I mean, I'd I'd like to like update at some point and like get one where I'm like, it's, a little bit more forthright. But. It's no, I actually really like the disarming sort of aspect of it. I think it's I, yeah, I think it's the one that maybe goes with this book, which yeah, it is a thing. Um, we're just about out of time, but I just want to ask one question: as an author, who like when you read reviews or anything that's ever been written you tend to sort of like hone in on like the negative part and like the really good parts sort of like wash over you. What is something that you read about this book that was so joyful and precious because, and imprinted on your heart because it was like, this is how I wanted to be seen. Um, gosh, I mean, I feel like, I can't think of like one specific thing, but maybe like maybe this is like greedy but it's like more of a theme that I've noticed in the criticism is that like everyone has been like in their criticism like almost like as gushy as I am in the book (laughs) so like I feel like people are really like meeting it on that level and like writing in a way where like I like I I have been a critic and I like I still write book reviews and like I love the moment in a review where like the little personality the person like pokes through a little and you can like kind of get a sense of who who read this book um and there was this really beautiful review in bitch magazine actually which is I think based in Portland um and I don't think I'm pronounce I'm going to pronounce the author's last name correctly but I think their name is Oliver Hogg um, H-A-U-G, I believe. And it was just such like a passionate review of the text. And I really felt like they just like saw it. Um, and, and I was like, wow, like, I can't believe that like something that I wrote could inspire something so beautiful. Um, so that really moved me. It really moved me to, to see someone engage and to see people continuously engaging with it on such a deep level. I mean, I think that's what this book is. It kind of gives permission to be like effusive and just like vulnerable and tender and unguarded and all that stuff. So it's a really yeah. big coup. I hope you're so happy and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for this great chat too. <laughs> yes, well, well, yes. Thank you so much for both of you for coming tonight. And uh, it was such an a awesome conversation and great reading and all that. So yeah. Uh, um, so everyone else watching, please please uh, consider purchasing a copy of Larissa's new book by visiting us at pals.com. While there, be sure to check out our uh, lineup of upcoming events. Yeah, there's the book right there. <laughs> so we we look forward to seeing you for another one of our events again soon. Oh, hold and yeah, oh yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes, that, <laughs> appreciate it. So La- Larissa, Mary, thanks again so much. And we're grateful for you both for coming and have a good night, everyone.
Bye. Thank love you, so you, Larissa. Everyone. Congratulations. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Good night.